uh, we will let Michael come pray for Alf. Thank you, God. Well, Heavenly Father, we just thank you for the word that you have given Alf. Mm -hmm. Lord, we ask that you would uh, just give him the confidence that he is hearing from you. Mm -hmm. And Lord, I ask that you would prepare all of our hearts for what you are about to say through him. In Jesus' name, mm -hmm. amen. Amen. And Lord, bless that worship team too, eh? Let's not forget, they uh, put in a lot of practice. Guys, that was awesome. Can we just have a clap for them before we all sit down? Woo! We are so blessed. Can I write this down? Don't touch your face, and, and the guy goes like this. He just wiped his nose on his sleeve. Like, <laughs> how is that safe? Anyway. Happy birthday to Ray Sweet. Woo! Turn around and look at Ray Sweet at the back there. Ray is 93 years old. Woo Happy birthday, Ray. Doorman. Yes. Yeah. Oh we missed you, Ray. I'm glad you're back. Glad you came today. So, the inspiration for today's uh, message came from uh, the television. Is that okay? A TV program. <laughs> All right. Whoever said no can leave. Uh, <laughs> I'll tell you about it in a few minutes. But what what we're going to talk today about is spiritual food. What are you eating? What are you feeding yourself with spiritually? And what effect is it having on you? You know, being healthy physically, we know, requires the right diet. If you have a deficiency in some area, your, your body will suffer in some way. And um, it's the same spiritually. If you are lacking some part of what makes up a healthy diet in your life spiritually, you will not be as spiritually healthy as you could be. It's not a judgment or a condemnation. It's just like, it's just like, like physically eating right. You know, it's like, come on. Do you want to feel good? Do you want to feel better physically? Do you want to have energy? Do you want to have spunk? Do you want to get up in the morning and, and be happy to greet the day? Well, eat right, you know, and don't eat the wrong things because the wrong things can wear you down or... A lack of something can wear you down. So what's in our diet? I'm going to start out with Matthew chapter 4 and verse 1. Jesus is led by the Spirit into the wilderness, and he's tempted there by the devil. For 40 days and 40 nights he fasted and became very hungry. Is that surprising? Has anybody here ever fasted for 40 days and 40 nights? I think there's a religion that fasts during the day and then eats at night. You know, for, uh, you know, for uh, a, a period of several days. Jesus actually fasted day and night. So he became very hungry. How many think you'd be hungry after 40 days of fasting? Yeah, I think so. So he's at, therefore, at a low point when the devil comes to him and says, If you are the Son of God, why don't you turn these stones into bread and nourish yourself? And Jesus' response is what I want to focus on today. Verse 4, Jesus told him, No, the scriptures say, people do not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. The message says it takes more than bread to stay alive. It takes a steady stream of words from God's mouth. And the, and the, the, the thought or the, the way the words are, are translated, that is the accurate way to translate that. It's not the word of God as in, okay, the Bible, you know. Yes, the Bible is the word of God. But God is always wanting to communicate with us. He's always wanting to speak to us. He's always available to interact with us and to talk to us. And Jesus is saying, 
Man lives not only by bread. Yes, we do, not only by bread. So we do need bread. Bread meaning, you know, symbolizing all food. We do need food to sustain us. But that's not what keeps us really alive. What keeps us really alive spiritually is what God is saying to us, what God is communicating with us, our interactions with God, our Father. The Passion says, bread alone will not satisfy, but true life is found in every word which constantly goes forth from God's mouth. Wow. I mean, some people are aware that God speaks to them at certain high points or at certain, you know, oh, I remember in 67, or, oh, that really ages me. I remember in uh, uh, 2006 when God spoke to me, you know. And, but, you know, God is always speaking. God is constantly wanting to communicate with his kids. I mean, you don't go years without talking to your, I hope, you don't go years without talking to your kids. But, you know, God, he's a good father. And he wants to be talking to us all the time. And so, you know, Jesus says it takes more than bread to stay alive. What do you think he means by stay alive? If you just had bread, if you just had food, physical food, would you stay alive? Yeah, you probably would stay alive. But what he's talking about is, he wants you to have life. Not just breathing in, breathing out, surviving the day, you know, dragging yourself from one day to the next. He wants you to be fully alive. Fully alive. So what does it take to do that? So in John chapter 4, Jesus is meeting with the Samaritan woman at the well, and uh, he talks to her for a bit, and we won't get into that story, and she heads off to town to tell all her friends and neighbors to come and see this amazing man. And meanwhile, the disciples in John 4, verse 31, were urging Jesus, Rabbi, eat something. But Jesus replied, I have a kind of food you know nothing about. So once again, Jesus is trying to pry their thinking away. He, uh, throughout his whole ministry, he's trying to pry their thinking away from A, the Messiah has not come to establish the national kingdom of Israel, to throw the Romans into the Mediterranean, and establish a king again in Jerusalem, and the Jews would have their own, you know, at that, at that time. That, that's not why the Messiah came. He's trying, he's, he's, he had to, and, and most of them didn't get it at all, at least until Pentecost and the church started. You know, but, but he's, he's trying to pry their thinking and our thinking away from that which is purely physical. We, we get so caught up in the physical that we miss the spiritual. And Jesus is, you know, he's, he, he wants us to see the ultimate reality because our life down here is this long and eternity is eternity. Yeah. To be in, you know, I go to prepare a place for you. There's a place for us. Right. And so Jesus said, I have a kind of food you know nothing about. Did someone bring him some food while we were gone? The disciples asked each other. Then Jesus explained, my nourishment comes from doing the will of God who sent me and from finishing his work. So we talked in the first scripture about hearing the word of God. Jesus said, nourishment comes from doing the will of God. So there's, it's kind of like a two-step thing here. Doing is what actually nourishes you and, and feeds you. So practically, when you see a need, and we encourage people to do this all the time. When you see a need and you're made aware of it, you should always ask your father, Father, is this my assignment? How many know that we are not called to live upon the earth to meet every single need that we come across? Yeah. Did you know that? Is that a, isn't that a relief? I know that was sure a huge relief for me when I figured that out. Instead of running around trying to be everything for everybody and meet everybody's need, the Father has assignments for me yeah. every day. I had one this week where a fellow quite a bit older than me was listening to my story about how, you know, he was asking me about my life and telling me about his and about how he, you know, I, I said, you know, it was such a relief when I realized I didn't have to perform for approval. I, was, I, I did that for 40 years, you know. And he said, oh, man, um, we, we need to talk some more because I'm still there, you know, and, 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 and that's that's. It's, it's interesting to see a hungry heart, you know, yeah. again, even somebody even older than me. I mean, yeah. you know, wow. <laughs> anyway, so when we see a need and ask the Father if this is our assignment and then do it, we're feeding ourselves. Mm. Isn't that interesting? 
We're feeding our spirit. We're feeding our spiritual life. My nourishment, Jesus says, comes from doing the will of my Father. Wow. Okay. So, doing. If, you, if I think about being generous, I think about being generous a lot. <laughs> but thinking about being generous doesn't feed my spirit. What feeds my spirit is being generous. Yeah. You get the point? So knowing something is great. That's, that's a good step. Knowing. The Father, you know, has an assignment for you. The nourishment, what feeds your spirit, what makes you truly alive, is doing it. Come on. Yeah. Wow. And so, acting out of generosity is what feeds me. Feeds you. So let's look at the early church's spiritual diet. We talked last week about Pentecost, and this is the end of the Pentecost chapter, Acts 2, and uh, sort of gives a, a rundown of what they were up to and what they focused on and what spiritual food they ate, how, they, how the early church was nourished in those days. Acts 2, starting at 42. And all the believers, somebody say, all the believers. All the believers, all the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, to sharing in meals, including the Lord's Supper, and to prayer. A deep sense of awe came over them all, and the apostles performed many miraculous signs and wonders. And all the, all the believers, all say all the believers, all the believers, met together in one place and shared everything. Say shared everything. Shared everything. everything they had. They sold their property and possessions and shared the money with those in need. They worshiped together at the temple each day. I think we should have church each day, don't you? Come on. Go Terry! <laughs> each day they, uh, they met in homes for the Lord's Supper. They shared their meals with great joy and generosity. All the while praising God and enjoying the goodwill of all the people. And each day the Lord added to their fellowship those who were being saved. Yeah, wow. wow. No wonder the early church thrived and was alive and had this amazing reputation. They just, everything they did was in community, was together, it was generous, it was not selfish, it was, it was worshiping God, it was, you know, just, just being together in so many uh, different ways. And it... I just again notice that all the believers devoted themselves to this. They were of one mind at that point. Isn't that great? No wonder they were so vibrant. So it's important to take stock of, um, see, this is what they occupied themselves with, and that's why the church exploded. That's why these men have turned the world upside down, right? Which was said of them. So, um, because they had a balanced diet, their spirits were very much alive, and they were out there, and daily people were being added. People were being saved. People were brought into the, the fellowship, you know? And so, yeah, it's important to take stock, for us to take stock, and see if our spiritual diet is lacking. Here's where the TV series comes in. How many have ever heard of the program Alone? Tony has. Way to go, Jolene. You watch it? Yeah. Yeah, a few of you. I love watching it. There's a couple of shows like that. There's another one called Life Below Zero. It's about people that, you know, live mostly by themselves up in the Arctic in, the, in Alaska and so on. But Alone is a, a kind of a competition show where they drop people off, sometimes in individuals and sometimes in groups of three, and when they do the individual one, they drop them off by themselves. I think the first one was on Vancouver Island, west coast of Vancouver Island. But since then, they've been to Patagonia and Mongolia, Mongolia and Alaska and the Arctic and so on, all over the world. But anyway, so they drop people off separately with some equipment, and whoever lasts the longest wins, like $500,000 or whatever. You know, it's quite an incentive. And... Uh, so anyways, we were watching, Pam and I were watching one the other day where they dropped three guys off together. They changed it up a bit. And they dropped them off in the Arctic with no equipment whatsoever. Nothing. Not a knife. Nothing. No rope. Zero. What they had on were their boots, their clothes, their jacket, their hat, their gloves. Boom. 
get off the boat onto the beach. The one thing they were given, now close your ears, all you people who don't like hunting or anything like that, but was one large dead animal, which was shot just before they were dropped off. So the, in this one, the three guys were dropped off, and so they're, they're, they're led by, so they're dropped off on a beach, a flare goes up from the people who are running the show to tell them where the animal is, and so they run, it's about a mile, they run, they come across the carcass of a musk ox. <laughs> they have no tools. They have to find sharp rocks and chip rocks into knives and so on and quickly because things spoil. They have no matches. They have no lighters. They have no nothing to make fire with. They, have, they don't have a, even a bow drill kit. They have nothing. They have to make it. So anyways, it's quite a fun, it's, it's a fun show. I love it because these guys are trained survivalists. They're, they know bushcraft and that. And, and so these, these particular three guys on the show we watched last week survived and made it to the 30 days, didn't have to tap out. And, uh, but the thing I drew out of that was, so they had a, an entire musk ox and they got their stone knives and they skinned it and they used the hide eventually for bed mats because they had nothing, they had no sleeping bags, nothing. And it's like freezing. And so, anyway, so uh, they, they made fish hooks out of little bits of bone and, uh, and, and they stripped uh, tendon or sinew and made fishing line out of it. Wove it together, made fishing line. And that comes into play at the end. But, you know, so everything they had to do would make just with what they had there. But the interesting thing was they had all this meat. They, they got a fire going eventually. They get a setup. They smoke the meat. They dry it out. They have all this meat. They have an abundance of meat. What they don't have is almost any fat. And I learned something. These guys are trained, and so they know, and so they're talking. There's cameras set up all over the place so, you, you know, so they can have a show, right? But no crew. But no crew around to help them or anything. So just planted. And so anyway, I learned that you can't live on straight protein. You need fat. You can have all the protein you want. And these guys are losing like 20 pounds each over the course of a few weeks, eating as much, you know, apparently, Muskox isn't very tasty, like uh, <laughs> it, And when they smoked it and dried it, it was incredibly chewy. <laughs> you know, like, I don't think if you had dentures, you probably would survive. You know, like, anyway, they didn't like it very much, but they had as much as they could eat, but they didn't have any fat. And slowly but surely, apparently, your brain starts to shut down, and it doesn't function properly, and you get lethargic, and you still lose weight, and you get weak, and you get less and less energy to actually do what you need to do. And so they, of course, recognized that after the little bit of fat was gone, and they began to spend a lot of their time pursuing fat. And that's where fishing line and fishing hooks came in. They crafted and were throwing into the lake that was beside them, and no luck, no luck. So they're getting weaker and weaker and weaker. They're rapidly going downhill by the two-thirds mark, by about the 20th day or so, something like that, of their adventure. Physically, mentally, lethargic. Just a couple of days before their 30 days was up, their fishing finally paid off. They caught a 10-pound lake trout, like a large lake trout. And they were absolutely, one guy just fell on the ground on the beach like he was, why? And we finally found something. Because apparently lake trout are full of fat and the good kind. And so they, they actually finished strong. Like their term was 30 days and they made it. And when they came to be picked up, they were strong and, and felt good and were happy. They didn't have to be dragged off with stretchers or anything like that. They survived. They regained their energy because... They recognized what they were short of. They went out all out to find it. They found it, they ate it, and it brought them back to life. And so I want to use that as a picture today. You know, um, you have to look after your own health. Yeah. It's individual, it's also corporate. I'll get to that in a minute. But these guys knew what they needed themselves, went out, spent the energy to find it, finally got it, and it made them healthy again. So, another time, 
There was a guy on a different uh, series. There was a guy who, at the end of his time, he just couldn't find any fat, anything to balance his food at all. And so, eventually, the camera just showed him, whenever it came to him, he was just laying in his sleeping bag in his shelter. And he mumbled into the camera, I'm spending between 17 and 22 hours in my sleeping bag because I just don't have the energy to do anything else. Well, guess what? He tapped out pretty soon after that. Because covering your head and hiding when you have a need or avoiding what you actually need doesn't, doesn't help you. Yeah. Nobody was going to bring it to him. The point was he had to make it on his own or tap out, right? And so Christianity and the community is not quite making it on your own. Like I said, we'll get to that in a minute. But the point is burying your head isn't helpful, will, will not help you. You have to recognize what you need, go after it, get it, and use it properly. And so look after your own health. So yeah, it's important to be self-aware enough to recognize that we have a need somewhere, that we're not thriving. Some people say, well, I feel great. I feel like my spiritual health is really good. Well, you want to stay that way? Do you think where you're at is the peak of spirituality? If not, then God wants to take you further. And so, you may not be spending 22 hours a day in bed because you're so depressed, but, you know, you may be reasonably happy, but there's still ground for you to take. There's still places for you to go. There's still room for growth. There's still more life that you can embrace. And so this is for everybody. And so, um, knowing what we're missing just gives us a target to shoot for. Come just on. gives us a, something that we need to search out and find. Come on. In another, one more episode from Alone. <laughs> this is where they're by themselves, but they have a lot of tools. They're allowed to take X number of pieces of equipment. And this guy picks a, a heavy-duty bow, bow and arrow. And... Uh, as, his, as one of his tools. And believe it or not, this guy in the Arctic, with a bow and arrow, okay, close your ears if you're sensitive, kills a moose. Like a big, full-grown, big rack moose with a bow and arrow. Michael's, Michael's he, impressed. So, he was very impressed with himself. He thought, I'm going to win for sure. I've got all this meat. I've got, on the carcass of a moose, there's, a, there's enough fat you know, I don't need any other food. What I need is a way to keep it away because there's bears around. You can see bears from time to time. Some of the guys had to chase off bears by throwing rocks at them because that's all they had, you know. Anyway, so this guy goes back to his camp, hauls everything back to his camp, and he builds this tall cache, you know, like, I don't know, 15 feet in the air. And out of four poles, puts it across, hangs all it, puts all, actually builds a platform on top, puts all his meat on there. I am set. All I have to do is cut firewood, sit by my fire, climb up and chop up a piece of meat for the day and some fat, I'm good. Well, guess what? In the middle of the night one night, he discovers, because there's cameras out there even while he's sleeping, uh, a wolverine comes, climbs up the, into his cache, Probably a starving wolverine, because you know what he did? He's smart, he didn't eat the meat, he ate all the fat, gone. The guy wakes up in the morning, and uh, I don't know if he checked his camera or what, or sees scratch marks on his poles, but he climbs up into his shelter and he looks and he goes, all I've got left is protein. And so once again, here he is. So when you have what you need to stay healthy, it's really important to guard it. Yeah. You know, guard your hearts, Come on. we're told. Come on. Like, guard your activities. Guard what you, you know, the good stuff that you have. Guard it. Treasure it. Don't let the enemy come, like Jesus in the, in the sowing of the seeds. The birds of the air come and pick up the seed, you know, which is the word of God that's in your life. And, and, and consume it, and it's gone. We have to guard it. We have to guard what's been entrusted to us. I said one more, but there's one more. <laughs> one more last one, just to uh, 
show you a little bit of the negative side. One guy gets so desperate that he catches a fish, and he's so desperate he's on the beach gutting it, and he eats part of it raw. Like, I don't know, I guess he's, you know, he, he's saying to the camera, yeah, you can eat this stuff, and uh, it's actually pretty good for you, and uh, I'm going to cook the rest of it, but I'm going to eat this. Well, guess what? By midnight or 1 o'clock in the morning, the cameras show him out in the dark, in a fetal position on the ground, groaning and howling and getting sick, and, and he taps out. He's done. He's, de he's deadly sick. He's poisoned himself by what he ate. So we have to be careful what we eat, don't we? Physical example of spiritual. Be careful. Be careful what you eat. So, if we allow ourselves to ingest negativity and criticism, we shouldn't wonder if our overall spiritual and mental condition goes down. You shouldn't wonder if you don't feel just on top of the world spiritually. If you are eating, embracing, listening to, participating in negativity and criticism that is not productive. People sometimes get disillusioned and frustrated by the fact that the church isn't perfect. The church is not led by perfect people. Anywhere, ever, in the history of the church. Paul had to publicly confront the Apostle Peter when he slipped back into a bits of the law in order to impress the law-keeping, you know, the, the, the people of the who joined Christianity but wanted to get to also embrace the Moses' law. So if even Peter, who was the man in the first part of the early church, if even he had to be confronted about doing something that was not right because it was influencing many others, is it possible that we can understand that nowhere ever has the church been led by perfect people? Yeah. Any church. But some people get disillusioned and frustrated to the point where they begin to spout criticism and negativity, and they begin to feed on it, yeah. and feed on it, and feed on it, and feed on it, until really spiritually they're on the ground throwing up. You know, they're on the ground sick and in pain because of it. And if it carries on long enough, people will tap out. And I've seen it happen on a number of occasions. So if we listen to complaint and criticism that's not constructive, because there is constructive um, critique, if you'd like, or, and yeah, a good church leader, if I ever find one, I'll tell you who he is, will listen to critique and, oh, wait a minute. Wow. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> we'll, we'll listen, and if, it's ha and if it's done in a constructive way to in improve relationship or improve a certain area of life, that's great. Yeah. That's awesome. That's how we grow. Yeah. We look out for each other. All of us together. And so the responsibility to stay healthy and eat good spiritual food is individual, yes. But we also have a responsibility to help each other to stay healthy yeah. and eat healthy. I'm going to read you a couple of scriptures. Hebrews 12, verse 15 says, look after each other. Say that out loud. Look after each other so that none of you fails to receive the grace of God. Watch out that no poisonous root of bitterness grows up to trouble you, corrupting many. It's bad enough if, if you have a bitter root growing up in you, but if you spread it around, it corrupts many. And so, what do we do about that? How do we look after each other? One of the things I learned in the, the uh, discipleship course that uh, we ran through with the uh, several guinea pigs, right, Jonathan? Uh, during this winter, at a men's group and a women's group, one of the things I learned about, uh, out of it was the beginning of Matthew 7 talks about judge not or you will be judged for the measure that you judge others, you'll be judged yourself. How can you say to your, your fellow, 
uh, let me take the speck out of your own eye when you have a beam in your own, or out of your eye when you have a beam in your own eye. First get rid of the beam in your own eye, and then you'll be able to see clearly to help take the speck out of your brother's eye. And we look at, I've looked at all that all these years, probably seen the, the, you know, the actual truth at the end there, but focus mostly on, yeah, don't, 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 you know, confront anybody about what's going on. But what Jesus said is if you take care of the problem in your own life, then you will be able to help your brother. So the whole point of community is us being able to help help our brothers to see areas where we're lacking or where we're eating the wrong food, where we've got a bad spiritual diet or where we're lacking in some area. The passage says, first, uh, John, sorry, Matthew 7, verse 5, first acknowledge your own blind spots and deal with them, and then you'll be capable of dealing with the blind spot of your friend. So we actually are allowed to, and now don't go running around like little uh, River Community Church policemen, you know, and telling everybody everything they're doing wrong. It says, first make sure that your own life is, is clean in that area before you do, but it says then you will be capable of helping your friend with his blind spot. So if someone is less and less spiritually healthy in our community, do we just let them be? Oh well, have fun with that. It's not very good, but you know, enjoy. So the closer I am to somebody, the more responsibility I have, this is the way I look at it, the closer I am to somebody, the more responsibility I have to care for them in this way. And you know, Pam and I many times have had to remind ourselves, I noticed she's left now because she knows I'm coming to this part <laughs> in the message because she reads it over once in a while. So Pam and I have many times had to remind each other about, hey, tone of voice, or hey, you're starting to sound negative because we love each other. Um, most of the time, I take it with such grace. <laughs> But Jesus said, first acknowledge your own blind spots and deal with them, and then you'll be capable of dealing with the blind spot of your friend. We're so afraid of confrontation. You know, but if we love each other, to the extent that we love each other, if you hear somebody being negative and critical, you know that Jesus said, if you're critical of others, like if you judge others, you will be judged with the, the same measurement. So if you love someone, do you want them to go through their life being judged all the time? Do you want them to? No, you don't. So if you, if you see that they're reaping what they sow, would it, would it be good to find some way to lovingly say, you know, let me just, can you just accept something from me? I feel like you're being a little negative. And I don't really want to hear it anymore. Unless it's constructive. Can we do that? I don't know. It's what we're called to. I'll read you another scripture about that in a minute. So a balanced diet is so important. We read all the things, the fellowship, the meals, the generosity, the worshiping together, that the early church, you know, uh, that the early church functioned in, that the early church ate as their spiritual diet. And it's not a list to make anybody feel guilty. It just describes the characteristics of a healthy, a healthy body of people, a healthy community. So recognizing what we're lacking and then pursuing it is the key. Recognizing when we're consuming negativity and putting a stop to it is a key. Recognizing is not enough, but it's a good start. Actually doing something about it is the way back to health. Or even to become more healthy and vibrant. Jesus' diet was doing the will of the Father. Doing, my nourishment comes from doing the will of my Father. And the will of my Father is, don't judge or you will be judged. Jesus only taught what his Father told him to teach. I say exactly what he tells me, and I say it how he tells me to say it, Jesus says in John. So, doing the Father's will. Are we feeling lethargic at times during this time? I know I am. Anybody else just sometimes feeling lethargic? Yeah, I'm almost the only one, but not quite. That's good. 
What am I missing? What am I lacking in my diet? I have to take stock. This is these shows that I was talking about. God was speaking to me through this, through those alone shows that I was watching. What am I missing that's making me lethargic, feeling weaker, feeling less like going, doing what I know I need to do? What am I missing? Is it the word? Is it generosity? Is it fellowship? What are you missing? What am I going to do about it? Yeah. Am I going to just continue to eat what I've been eating and pretty soon I'll be 22 hours in my sleeping bag? Or will I recognize what it is that I'm lacking and go out in pursuit and find it and guard it and stop eating what's making me sick? What are we going to do about it? Am I getting negative and critical? What have I consumed that's making me sick? Whose voice am I listening to? What am I going to do about it? So as a community, how should we position ourselves to improve and grow and in health and, and stop eating what's making us, what can make us sick? Last scripture is 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. And I've chosen the amplified version because it kind of amplifies things exactly the way I want it to. So it's appropriate for me. Starting at verse 11. Therefore, encourage and comfort one another and build one another up, just as you are doing. We earnestly urge you, believers. Say, earnestly urge. Earnestly urge. It's, this is not a mild suggestion. This is an urgent, urgent, uh, earnest urgency behind this. We earnestly urge you, believers, admonish those who are out of line. Do we have a responsibility? Are you your brother's keeper? You know, from day almost day one, that's, you know, what's gone around. Just look after myself. Thank you very much. Maybe my own family. Am I my brother's keeper? Now, in case you think Paul is just writing to the leaders, I want you to know that the first letter to the Thessalonians is written to the church at Thessalonia, and at Two verses below where I'm, where I'm going to finish reading today, it says, Paul says, I put you under oath to read this to all the brothers. So it's for everybody. I earnestly urge you to admonish those who are out of line. The undisciplined, the unruly, the disorderly. Encourage the timid. This is also part of the urgent admonition. Encourage the, tim the timid, those who lack spiritual courage. Help the spiritually weak. Be very patient with everyone, always controlling your temper. See that no one repay, uh, repays another with evil for evil, but always seek what is good for one another and for all people. Rejoice always and delight in your faith. Be unceasing and persistent in prayer. He's, again, he's presenting. This is the menu. This is, what, this is what will balance you out. Starts out with admonish those who are out of line. And then it goes on to give you good things. Rejoice always and delight in your faith. Be unceasing and persistent in prayer. In every situation, even when you're in a pandemic, no matter what the circumstances, be thankful and continually give thanks to God for this is the will of God for you in Christ Jesus. Do not quench, subdue, or be unresponsive to the working and guidance of the Holy Spirit. Do not scorn or reject gifts of prophecy or prophecies, spoken revelations, word of instruction, exhortation, or warning. Ooh. Verse 21, but test all things carefully so you can recognize what is good, hold firmly to what is good, abstain from every form of evil, withdraw and keep away from it. Wow. That's a recipe for a good spiritual diet to stay healthy spiritually, to grow spiritually, to move forward spiritually, to embrace actually and discover the abundant life or the full life that God intended when he created you. When he made a little spirit and put it in your mother's womb in that couple of cells when they started and designed you, formed you in your mother's womb, he had in mind that you should live an amazing life. And he closes it off with, now may the God of peace himself, because, you see, it's not 
Okay, go and do this, you, you Christians. Go and do this. It's all up to you. No, no, listen. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you through and through. That is, separate you from profane and vulgar things, make you pure and whole and undamaged, consecrated to him, set apart for his purpose. And may your spirit, soul, and body be kept complete and be found blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Faithful and absolutely trustworthy is he who is calling you to himself for your salvation. And he will do it. He will fulfill his call by making you holy, guarding you, watching over you, and protecting you as his own. Remember the Father is always with us. He's helping us to understand and uh, stay healthy. The Father is holding your hand. He's, you're his son. You're his daughter. He want, he's promised. He who started a good work in you will complete it, will finish it. Isn't that good? He's committed to us being healthy and complete in spirit, soul, and body. Amen? Yeah. Amen. What's in your diet? What are you missing? The signs are you're feeling a little bit unwell in some area. The question is, oh God, not just, oh God, help me, get rid of all this stuff. It's no God, what, what, what should I be embracing? What should I be consuming? What should I not be consuming? That's making me feel this way. And God will be faithful to hold your hand and show you and teach you and guide you and give you the nutrition that you need. Amen? Amen. 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 So it kind of goes along with the theme we've been hearing all morning from the Holy Spirit about being all in, isn't it? And about, um, you know, giving our all to Jesus because we want to feed on the things that are going to bring us life. And so it's so easy. I mean, we all know. We all love sweets and sugar, and that should be... Chocolate should be an essential food group, but apparently it's not, and you can't just live on sugar. So let's stand, and we're just going to ask the Lord to make an adjustment. Are you willing to do that? Yes. Just to let him, maybe it's just in, even in your own mind, maybe your mind veers off into negativity. Maybe you're stuck on, you know, I don't want to give up what feels good. So we're just going to pray this. Holy Spirit. Would you please adjust me so that what I'm taking in will bring me life, will strengthen me, and will strengthen the people around me. You said I could have an unveiled face. And if I'm doing anything that's causing your glory to be veiled, then what I ask today Adjust my diet, what I'm taking in spiritually, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So expecting to hear that you've had a turnaround this week, that God has shown you what you need to eat to be healthy. And um, always, always give us feedback. Let us know. Did that speak to you today? How did it affect your week? We'd really love to hear from you. So God bless everybody. See you all at home. Hope it's your turn to come next week. So come out. And again, if you want to be a part of the Words of Knowledge, 6.30 tonight. Okay, God bless.
So whether you're at home or whether you're here, oh, oh, yeah, Lord, we just want to respond to that. Come on, let's, let, you know, it's like renewing your vows, your wedding vows. Let's just renew those vows to him and say, I'm all in. You know, I put my trust in you. You know, you will be my firm foundation. Have you felt shaky lately? Has your faith felt shaky lately? Then just stop and just say, Lord, I put myself fully into your arms. I fully trust you. You are my firm foundation. I plant my feet on the rock that will not be shaken. Lord, we give her all to you. I saw a picture as Jolene was singing, and I saw a house whose foundation has shifted, and I'm not a construction guy, and I know nothing about it, so uh, all you tilers and construction guys, you know, you can correct me if you want to later, but anyways, I saw that the foundation had shifted, and, and an inspector had come and said, you know, you're, there's something wrong, and but they were able to fix it by jacking up the house and restoring the foundation. And I just feel like for some of you, your foundation has shifted a bit. Whether you're online or whether you're here, that's not a condemnation. That's the Holy Spirit inspector coming and saying, let's fix this. Let's fix this. Let's jack your house up so that you're on a firm foundation. Because if you don't, pretty soon your house will start being um, uneven and unequal in places. There will begin to appear cracks in walls and in your, in your flooring. So come on, if that's you, just close your eyes right now and say, Lord, I can sense my foundation has shifted. It's sunk a bit, and I need you to come in and just restore. So Holy Spirit, we ask right now for those that are needing just a restoration of their foundation, just a renewal of their foundation. Would you come in and would you do the repair work? Would you jack up what needs to be jacked up? Would you shore up what needs to be shored up? Would you fill up what needs to be filled up? So there will no, be, no longer be any shifting or shaking, but a firm house again. But a firm house again with no worries. With no worries of accidents or things being destroyed. We don't want to be on a shaky, uneven ground. Yeah, so just let him come right now. He seems to be on that theme today. So let's just respond to him, even if it's the smallest thing. Say, come in. Because small things can grow to big things. Let him come. Let him come. Oh. And I just heard as I was saying that, somebody saying in their head, it's no big deal. It's no big deal. I want you to know that that's not God saying that. Whoa! You know, your flesh and the enemy will try to keep you in a dangerous place. So no big deal becomes a big deal. So Father, we just say right now, renew our minds. Because we want to be all in for Jesus. want to be all in. Oh, not religiously, but relational. So can you allow him to move into your house? He says he wants to make his home in you. So whatever shape your house is in, say, open up the door and say, come on in. Come on right now. Just open up the door to your, your hearts. Say, come on in and make your home in me. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are coming as guests today. If you don't have to clean up, they will be the ones that they're coming for relationship, not to check on your house. So just make your home in us today. Make your home in us today. Yeah. Thank you, Lord. And let the world see. Let the world see something shining through us today. Amen. And Christine, I heard um, that, uh, it's from Habakkuk. And it's actually a prayer in Habakkuk where it says, Lord, I have seen, I have heard of your fame and stand in awe of your, of your good deeds. And I felt like the Lord was saying, but that's how I feel about her. I feel like the Lord was just saying, well done, good and faithful servant. And he knows your good deeds. Or maybe nobody else sees, but he knows your good deeds. So I bless you. You're such a woman of God. Keep growing. And then I felt like, too, that there was somebody else. I think one of these could be Pam Van Dock, but I think that it could be for others. Pam, I felt like the Lord was saying he loves the sound of your prayers. And so I got Psalm 141 for you, verse 2. 
May my prayers be set before you as incense in your presence. And I just felt like the Lord was saying, that's what your prayers are like for him. They're like incense. They're just like an incense. And I feel like there's some other people who love to pray. And if that's you, whether you're here or at home, I want you just to put your hand up. Because I want to pray a blessing. There's a, a fragrance that God wants to release over your prayers. An incense to come before his presence in a new way. So, Father, I pray for those that love to pray. I pray for those that have felt like their prayers are dribbling off their chins. And he said, he will not allow the enemy to take away your reward. And your reward is that he hears. And your reward is that your prayers are like incense before him. And your reward is your prayers are making a difference. And your reward is your prayers are stirring up much activity in the heavenlies. And the reward is that he knows your voice. He can recognize you if his eyes were closed, but he never has his eyes closed. And your reward is that he said, you are like a fragrant incense to me. So I bless your prayers right now. I bless the excitement and the love of just praying to him. And I bless his presence to grow thicker with you. And I bless his prayer time with you and your time with him to just be sweet and to just be fragrant. And I bless you in that. 